Hi everyone, my name is Kuvina and welcome to Explaining Every Sorting Algorithm Part 3. Like before, check the description for corrections and also flashing lights warning. The previous videos covered all these algorithms and this one will cover variations and hybrids of those. Now you might wonder, what's the point of hybrid algorithms if we've already achieved optimal average time complexity? Well, there are at least four more factors to consider, so we'll take a look at those first and then get into the algorithms. First is actual performance on hardware, because the time complexity can only tell you so much. The weights defined doesn't account for constant scaling factors, so if algorithm A is always 5 times faster than B, it will actually have the exact same time complexity. And algorithms with worse time complexity can even be faster for small lists. For example, insertion sort is faster than quicksort up to a certain point, somewhere from 7 to 50 depending on hardware. This is because things like recursion can be computationally expensive. You also have to factor in CPU cache and branch missed predictions. The second factor is adaptability. An adaptive sorting algorithm is one that can take advantage of existing patterns in the list. These occur all the time in real data and can cause best cases and worst cases. For example, a roughly sorted list is great for insertion sort but bad for quicksort. A backwards list is bad for both of them, but great for pancake sort. Now there is one easy way to get rid of worst cases, which is to randomize the list before sorting. This way, patterns go from common to about as likely as BOGO sort finishing in reasonable time, so you'll practically never get a worst case. But this also applies to best cases. Ideally, we want to turn worst cases into best cases. Also, using randomness makes an algorithm non-deterministic, meaning it might behave differently even given the same input twice. The third factor is stability. A stable algorithm is one that preserves the relative order of pieces with equal values. Technically, you can make any algorithm stable by assigning each piece an extra value denoting its original location and using these to break up any ties you encounter. This works, but requires O of n extra space complexity. Speaking of which, space complexity is the last factor. We've seen how there's a space-time trade-off, but that also applies to the other factors. A hybrid algorithm might choose to be great at four of these at the cost of sacrificing one, but a truly robust algorithm will account for all of them. With that out of the way, let's get into the algorithms. Quicksort with LL pointers is just quicksort with a slightly different partitioning method. Basically, the right sublist moves along as you build it. This time, A and B both start on the left side. If B is bigger than the pivot, then you move B to the right. But if it's smaller, you swap A and B and move both positions to the right. It has the same time complexity as a regular quicksort, but it's a bit slower. Dual pivot quicksort is just quicksort with two pivots. This means every round divides the pieces into three sublists. Those smaller than both pivots, those greater than both, and those in between. It kind of combines the two different quicksort partitioning methods. You start by comparing the first and last pieces, swapping if the first is bigger. The first one is pivot 1, and the last one is pivot 2. Now you need to keep track of three positions. A and B start at the start, and C starts at the end. Then you check the value at B on loop with the following conditions. If it's smaller than pivot 1, swap it with A, and move both A and B to the right. If it's bigger than pivot 2, swap with C and move C to the left. If it's neither, then simply increase B. Once B passes C, you can move the pivots to the boundaries and then it's recursion time. The time complexity is still the same though. Proportion extend sort fixes quicksort's worst case by putting more thought into choosing a pivot. The ideal pivot would be the median, since it would cut the list in half every time. But finding the median requires you to sort the list in the first place. So proportion extend sort first sorts 1 16th of the list, takes the median of that sample, and uses it as a pivot to partition the rest. It sorts the 1 16th recursively, which is fine because with sublist size under 32, it just becomes regular quicksort. It is still possible to get bad partitions, but the pivot is guaranteed to be bigger than 1 32nd of the list and smaller than 1 32nd, so in the worst case, there are log base 32 over 31 of n recursion levels which is still pretty bad, but it is technically in O of log n. IntroSort is a hybrid algorithm based mostly on quicksort. First of all, it uses the middle piece as the pivot. This helps against quicksort's worst enemy, an already sorted list, but it does still have weaknesses. So IntroSort keeps track of the current recursion level to keep it in O of log n. 
If it ever exceeds 2 log base 2 of n, then it sorts the sublist with heap sort, which is n log n guaranteed. Also, for sublist size smaller than 16, it uses insertion sort, which is also done by most hybrid algorithms. In fact, you can actually save these insertion steps for one big insertion sort at the end. Intrasort has a worst case n log n. Pattern defeating quicksort improves intrasort even further with three different techniques. Most of these only go into effect for large sublists, but those are hard to see, so my examples will apply these techniques to smaller sublists just to show how they work, even if it's not accurate to the algorithm. First of all, if it gets through our partitioning step without making any swaps, it means the sublist was already partitioned, which means there's a good chance it's already sorted. So the algorithm applies an optimistic insertion sort. It counts the number of swaps it's done, and if that gets to 8, it gives up and goes back to sorting recursively. But if it never gets to 8, that means it was able to sort that sublist in linear time. Pattern defeating quicksort also chooses the pivot differently. It looks at the first, last, and middle pieces, and takes the median of the three as a pivot. And for sublists bigger than 128, it actually takes three medians and uses the median of those medians. This makes bad partitions a lot less likely, but still possible. Even in the worst case though, there is still the backup of heap sort. The third technique is how it deals with many similar inputs. It has two different partition functions. Part right puts values equal to the pivot in the right sublist, and part left puts them in the left one. It usually uses part right, but if the pivot chosen is equal to the piece right before the current sublist, then it uses part left. This way, all the pieces in the left sublist will be exactly equal, so it doesn't even have to sort that one. These three techniques combined make pattern defeating quicksort a quite robust algorithm with linear time complexity for many patterns. But since it's based on quicksort, it's unstable, just like the previous ones. TimSort is a hybrid algorithm that is stable since it's based on merge sort. Here's how it works. First, set a value called minrun from 32 to 64 such that n over minrun is just under a power of 2. Then starting at the beginning, look for an already sorted run of pieces. This can be ascending or descending. If this run is shorter than minrun, then you artificially extend it with insertion sort and then flip it if it's backwards. Then you add it to a stack, which is just a data structure where you look at the most recently added ones first. Then move on to the next run and repeat the process. After every run you add to the stack, you have to verify two conditions are held. If x is the most recent followed by y and z, then y must be longer than x and z must be longer than x and y combined. If either condition is violated, then you merge y with either x or z, whichever is shorter, and check the conditions again on the new x, y, and z. On random data, this will just look like regular merge sort, but if there are some sorted runs, this strategy will avoid lopsided merges, making it slightly faster. TimSort also saves a bit of memory while merging. Instead of merging onto an auxiliary array and then copying it over, you can copy the two sublists over and then merge onto the original list. But if you do it this way, copying the second sublist is unnecessary since the values are still on the original list, and unlike the first sublist, they won't be overwritten until after you need them. TimSort also has the ability to skip ahead a bit if it finds itself repeatedly looking at the same list. With all of these techniques, TimSort is linear for even more patterns than pattern defeating quicksort. It uses a lot of space complexity, but it is stable. Iterative merge sort is another variant of merge sort that does all the merges of the same size in the same ground, going from the bottom up. First, it merges pieces into pairs, then pairs into groups of 4, then groups of 8, 16, and so on. Basically, on ground k, the sublist to be merged will have size 2 to the k. If n isn't a power of 2, you might encounter uneven merges. We can fix this by first defining a variable called scale, equal to n divided by the closest power of 2 less than or equal to n. For example, n equals 20 would have scale 1.25. Now on round k, sublists of size 2 to the k times scale would be ideal to avoid uneven merges. But that probably won't be an integer, so instead we take multiples of that and then round each one down, and these tell you where each sublist starts. This way, you might have a few uneven merges, but the sublist sizes differ by at most one. Then the sublists will be the same ones you get from regular merge sort.
But the advantage of iterative merge sort is that it doesn't use recursion, which takes up O of log n memory in merge sort. Removing it doesn't change space complexity since it still uses O of n memory for auxiliary arrays. But if we can remove this requirement as well, we can bring merge sort down to O of 1 space complexity. This property is called being in place, and finding an algorithm that's n log n in place and stable is kind of the holy grail of comparison-based sorting. We can achieve it by combining iterative merge sort with a linear, in place, and stable combined halves operation. But finding an algorithm for that is still a really hard problem. We'll look at a few that get close, and then one that finally achieves this goal. One idea is as follows. You have two current positions like usual, A and B. If A is smaller, you move on and check the next one. If B is smaller, you insert that piece at A, shift over the rest of the left sublist, and move both A and B over. This is in place and stable, but shifting everything over makes it take n squared time, so you may as well use insertion sort at that point. Another idea is to alternate between the two sublists. This would usually make a roughly sorted sublist, so you could just use insertion sort after. This is known as weave sort. You can easily do the weave part with the same n squared technique of shifting over, but even if you could do it in linear time, it would still be unstable. Now, you might remember Batonic Sort and the Odd Even Network each had their own in place ways to combine halves. Unfortunately, neither one is stable, but we can achieve stability with similar techniques. You'll notice that the Odd Even Network swaps entire chunks of the list at a time. This is called a rotation, and we can apply it to uneven sublists by simply reversing each one, then reversing them together. The algorithm that uses this is called Rotate Merge Sort. Given two sublists to be merged, you start by splitting the first into two halves, A and B, then figure out where the first piece of B belongs in the right sublist. This location will split it into C and D. Now do a rotation of B and C. You know every piece in B is strictly greater than every piece in C, so there's no risk of changing the relative order of equal values. Now you have two pairs of sublists to be merged, so you can apply the same thing recursively. Eventually, the two halves will be merged. The left sublist will always be split exactly in half, so you know there will only be O of log n recursion layers. This makes the combined halves operation n log n and the whole algorithm O of n log n squared. Due to the recursion, it uses O of log n space complexity, which is worse than O of 1, but some definitions would count that as in place, since it's still basically nothing compared to O of n. For example, even with a trillion inputs, it only recurses about 40 times. Quad sort is another hybrid merge sort similar to Tim sort. The space complexity is technically O of n, but it only uses auxiliary arrays up to size 1 8 of n, or possibly even less depending on some settings. It uses an iterative merge sort, starting with sublists of size 8, which are built with insertion sort. Quad sort merges two sublists onto an auxiliary array, but instead of copying it over, it does this again for the next two sublists. Then it merges the two new ones directly onto the original list, and this saves the step of copying over by effectively merging four at a time. But when the sublists get big enough, memory becomes a factor. Going from 16 to 8 sublists, there's only enough memory for one pair of sublists, so you can go back to copying it over. From 8 to 4, you can just use the technique from Tim Sort of only copying over the left sublist. From 4 to 2, there's not even enough memory for a single sublist, so you have to use the trick from Rotate Merge Sort and do one rotation. Then you can just merge each smaller pair using the auxiliary array. Note that uneven merges are no problem since only the left sublist needs to be copied and it's always cut exactly in half. As for the final merge, you just have to do two rotation layers. Quad sort has a lot more features that make it very fast and also adaptive, like knowing not to merge two sublists if the first piece of the second is greater than the last piece of the first. It was invented only three years ago and is becoming pretty popular with a lot of variations, but it still isn't in place. Now the algorithm that finally achieves optimal, stable, in-place merging is called block sort. Block sort is, in my opinion, the most complicated sorting algorithm there is. So complicated that it deserves its own video. That video will come out soon, and we'll also cover its variants, wikisort and grailsort. 
You can think of BlockSort as the final boss of sorting algorithms. For now, I'll just go over it briefly. So to merge two sublists A and B, you break them up into blocks. If A is the length of the first sublist, then you can use square root of A as the block size, and that will also be the number of blocks for each sublist. Swapping two blocks of the same size is really easy. You just have to swap the corresponding pieces of each one. Using this, you can rearrange the blocks. Each block will have an associated block value. For A blocks, it's the first piece, and for B blocks, it's the last piece. Now you just sort the blocks by their associated values. If there are any adjacent B blocks, you can combine them into a mega block. The final step is to go through the A blocks in reverse order and merge with the B mega block. You don't actually have to do a merge with the entire B mega block, only up until wherever the first piece of the last A block you merge ends up. Now you might be wondering how it's possible to do all of this optimally without auxiliary arrays. Well, it's not easy, and the specifics will be covered in the next video. But for now, just know that it reserves an area of the original list called a buffer and uses the values of the pieces already there to encode information about the blocks. Now let's look at a few variations on heap sort. All you have to do is replace the max heap with another type of structure where extracting the max is O of log n and building it is n log n. Ideally, you want it to be implicit, which means you can use the original list to store this structure. The first of these is weak heap sort. In a weak heap, each node must be greater than or equal to its right child and all descendants through that one, but not necessarily the left one. Node 0 is special and never has a left child, so now index i has a left child at 2i and a right child at 2i plus 1. Other than index 0, any node with 1 or 0 children must be in the last two rows. This means you can have gaps, but only in the last row. But these gaps mean it might not be possible to represent the weak heap in a size n array. If the subtrees of this node were swapped, though, it would be fine. So we store the weak heap like this, but have a secondary boolean array where a 1 at index i tells us the subtrees are actually flipped. So for that specific node, the left child is 2i plus 1, and the right one is 2i. For visualization purposes, though, we'll stick to having gaps. Each node has an associated node called its distinguished ancestor. To find it, you repeatedly take the parent until you end up going left. There's an operation called join, where given a node i, you find its distinguished ancestor, and if that value is smaller than the one at i, you swap the left and right subtrees of i, then swap the values of i and its distinguished ancestor. Swapping the subtrees is extremely easy, you just flip the corresponding value in the boolean array. Weak heap sort is as simple as building a weak heap, then repeatedly extracting the max. To build a weak heap, given a random list, you go through every piece backwards, and for each one, you call the join operation. Now to extract the max, you swap it with the value at the end of the array, which may or may not be the furthest to the right when visualized. Then decrease a variable called length to take it out of commission, and then do something called sift down from the top. To do that, you take the right child, and then repeatedly take the left child until there isn't one. The max value must be somewhere along this line, so following that same path backwards, you repeatedly call the join operation to bring it to the top and restore the weak heap property. Weak heap sort ends up being about twice as fast as the original heap sort. It does use O of n space complexity, but this is just a boolean array, which uses at most n bytes, unlike merge sort, whose auxiliary arrays store values from the list. Weak heap sort still has an issue. It's not adaptive. Every piece will at some point be swapped to the beginning and then to its destination, even if it's already there. If we had a structure with a max value at the end, we wouldn't have to swap it to put it in place. This would do better with almost sorted lists and allow O of n best case time complexity. Smooth sort does this using something called a Leonardo heap, which is made of Leonardo trees. A level 0 or 1 Leonardo tree is just a single node. For any other level, you just have a node with the previous two levels as its subtrees with the bigger one first. This means the size of a Leonardo tree can only take specific values. These are called the Leonardo numbers, and each one is 1 plus the sum of the previous two. 
Any positive integer can be expressed as a sum of distinct Leonardo numbers. So a Leonardo heap of size n is just a collection of Leonardo trees where their sizes add up to n and they satisfy the following properties. Each node is greater than or equal to each of its children, the trees decrease in size, and the root nodes are in increasing order. To build a Leonardo heap, you start with one of size 1 and repeatedly increase its size by inserting pieces in it. To do that, you first check if there are two trees of consecutive level. If yes, you can combine them as children of the new piece to get another Leonardo tree. Otherwise, you just add the piece as its own level 1 tree, or level 0 if you already have a level 1. When you do this, the properties might be violated, so to fix that, you do a kind of insertion sort on the root nodes. Going through them left to right, for each one, you repeatedly swap it to the left as necessary. You only swap if the left one is greater than the right one and its two children. After swapping to the left as much as necessary, you simply call max heapify on it. Extracting the max is a bit easier. It will always be the root of the rightmost tree. If that's a level 1 or a 0, you can simply remove it. Otherwise, removing it will create two new trees, so you have to do the insertion step on both of those. Now how do we represent the Leonardo heap implicitly? For a single tree, we just have the left subtree, then the right subtree, then the parent. This follows recursively. Each node has its right child one space to the left, and its left child x plus one spaces to the left, where x is the size of the right subtree. A Leonardo heap will have multiple trees, so how do we know which trees are present if we're just looking at the array? Well, we can actually keep track of this with a single variable. An unsigned integer has 32 bits, so we can say that each one tells you whether that level Leonardo tree is present. This is a bit of a cheap way to make it of one space complexity, because you technically need more if n is greater than about 7 million. In a strictly mathematical sense, it should be O of log n. Putting all this together, we can make an algorithm that gradually expands a Leonardo heap, then repeatedly extracts a max. Since the max value is always at the end, it means a roughly sorted list will require fewer operations, allowing O of n best case time complexity. Poplar sort is a variation of smooth sort. The difference is that the root nodes don't have to be in order. This makes adding new pieces faster because you don't have to sort the roots. But now to extract the max, you can't just take the last one. Instead, you have to check all the root nodes to find the largest. It's a bit faster than smooth sort on random lists, but since the biggest piece is not necessarily at the end anymore, it loses the O of n time complexity on mostly sorted lists. Ternary heap sort is pretty self-explanatory. Now each node has up to three children, and must be greater than or equal to each of them. Index i now has a left child at 3i plus 1, a middle child at 3i plus 2, and a right child at 3i plus 3. The height of a ternary max heap is log base 3 of x, 63% the height of a binary max heap. This would make the max heap of i faster, but finding the largest of the three children requires an extra comparison, so it's not really any faster. Now for some variations on radix sort, starting with making it in place. There are actually two different ways to do this, which I'm going to call shift and cycle. The cycle method is unstable, so it only works on MSD radix sort. The shift method can be used on both, but there's no reason to use it on MSD since cycle is way better. Therefore, if you eliminate that combination, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the methods, so people just name the variety of radix sort and the method is implied. Anyway, the cycle method is as follows. Just like before, you count how many pieces there are for each possibility of the digit in question, and take a prefix sum of this to determine where each sublist starts. This does technically have O of B space complexity. The next step is similar to cycle sort, but you don't have to go through the whole list to determine where a piece goes. Instead, starting with the first piece, you just check the digit and move it to the next available spot in the soon-to-be sublist. Before putting the piece in place, you have to take note of what's already there, and then you can repeat the process with that piece. And if you get back to where you started, move to the right and do the next cycle. This sorts by that digit in O of n time, which is the same as a regular radix sort. It uses less space complexity, but isn't stable. 
There's another unstable method that only works in base 2. It's pretty much just a partition step from quicksort. So you have two positions, starting one on each end, and they move towards the center, swapping if necessary. This is called binary quicksort, and it's the faster way to do this in the special case of base 2. But it is unstable, so it can only be used for MSD base 2 radix sort. Making the least significant digit variety stable is a lot more tricky. Just like in place merge sort, we want a sort by digit operation that's in place, stable, and ideally O of n. But the only methods I've seen for this seem to be O of n squared. My method is a bit different than what you'll see elsewhere, but I believe pretty much the same concept. It gradually grows the B sublist and keeps track of the starting position of each one. For each piece, it moves it to the end of the corresponding sublist, shifting pieces over, and increments the starting positions of the subsequent sublist. This works, but gives it a terrible time complexity, so there's no real reason to use this type of radix sort. American flag sort is another radix sort variation that relates to something called the Dutch national flag problem. Basically, if your list only has three possible values, red, white, or blue, what's the best way to sort it into the Dutch national flag? One efficient method is just the same thing from dual pivot quicksort, and you can also apply this to MSD radix sort in base 3. But what if we add more color? Well, sorting things into some constant number of categories is also what radix sort does. So if you use base 128, it's named American flag sort after the 128 stripes of the American flag. But why 128? Well, numbers are stored in binary, and 128 is 2 to the 7, so digits in base 128 correspond to blocks of 7 bits. Furthermore, strings encoded with ASCII assign each integer 0 to 127 to a character, so they're effectively just base 128 numbers. This means American flag sort efficiently sorts ASCII strings with a character-based radix sort. Burst sort is another string sorting algorithm. It uses something called a tree, spelled with an I, which categorizes strings alphabetically, based first on their first letter, then the second, then third, and so on, just like a radix sort. This works well for strings because there are commonly encountered patterns. It needs a lot of space complexity to build the tree, but this lets it sort strings very fast. Spread sort is a hybrid algorithm based on a recursive bucket sort. Now, in part 1, I said that applying bucket sort recursively basically becomes a form of MSD radix sort, but actually that's only true when you use a constant number of buckets regardless of n. Spread sort starts by sorting the pieces into n over c buckets. c is usually somewhere from 4 to 8, and this will also be the average bucket size. If the input isn't uniformly distributed, you might end up with a big bucket, which is the main issue with bucket sort. Spread sort gets around this by simply sorting recursively for bucket size above a certain threshold. Otherwise, it uses intro sort. Uneven buckets are often caused by outliers, so once those are gone, the buckets will become more uniform. Spread sort also has a lot of adaptive features that give it a best case time complexity O of n and worst case n log n. Sample sort is a variation on bucket sort that tries to avoid making uneven sublists in the first place. It does this by first sorting b-1 pieces. It then uses those values as splitters to sort the rest of the pieces into b buckets. Then it just sorts each bucket. You can also choose to sort b times s-1 pieces at the start, in which case the splitters are spaced s apart. In the examples I've shown, the values are uniformly distributed, and sample sort is actually worse than just using equal ranges. But if that's not the case, it can produce more evenly sized buckets, where a regular bucketing method wouldn't. You can actually apply this technique to any variation of bucket sort, but here I've just used it with a normal bucket sort. Proxmap sort is just bucket sort with one small difference. When moving pieces from the auxiliary array to the main one, it insertion sorts each bucket as it goes, rather than all at the end. This doesn't make it any faster or slower, because it still has to do all the same steps, just in a different order. Cartesian tree sort uses a special kind of binary tree that's constructed as follows. Given a random sequence of integers, use the largest value as the root node. Everything to the sides of it will become its two subtrees, and then you just apply this recursively to each one. 
Each node will be greater than or equal to each of its two children, so you can extract the max in basically the same way as heap sort. But our Cartesian tree can't be represented implicitly and needs O of n space complexity. And now by popular demand, it's time for even more joke sorting algorithms. First is stone sort. Instead of rearranging the pieces, simply purge as many as necessary to end up with a sorted list. One method for this is similar to strand sort. You just go through the list and remove any piece smaller than the last one you kept. But if you want to save as many as possible, you have to find the longest increasing subsequence. That can actually be done in n log n time with the following algorithm. So basically, you go through the list left to right while keeping track of several candidate subsequences. These will have different lengths, and the final values for each one will be ascending. Now for each piece, use a binary search to find where its value would go within those. If it's less than all of them, you replace the size 1 candidate with it. If it's greater than all of them, you add it to the longest so far, and this becomes a new candidate. But if it's between two of them, you add it to the one above, and have this replace the one below. By the time you're done, you'll have the longest increasing subsequence. Next is sleep sort. The sleep function simply waits a given amount of time before executing the next line. If you use multi-threading, you can have several of these run concurrently. So to sort the list, you start a thread for each piece that sleeps a duration proportional to its value, and then outputs that value. Miracle sort is similar to Bogo sort, but it cuts out the step of randomizing the list. So basically, if the list is sorted, you're done, and if not, just wait a little bit and then check again. Hopefully, a miracle will have happened, but if not, you could just keep repeating. There's also a minor optimization of sorting in close proximity to a uranium source to take advantage of radiation. Then there's Bogo Bogo sort, or Bogo squared sort. In regular Bogo sort, you check whether the list is sorted by going through each adjacent pair, and if even a single pair is out of order, so is the list. But another way to do this is to simply make a copy of the list, sort the copy, and then see if they match. This is what Bogo squared sort does. You might be tempted to sort this copy recursively, but that presents an issue. In order to sort the copy, you need to make another copy. Recursion only works if the sublist gets smaller every time, otherwise you get an infinite loop. So it actually uses a slightly different version of Bogo squared sort for this step, which I'm going to call BBS2. The alternate form is as follows. First, sort the first n minus 1 pieces using regular Bogo squared sort. Then, check if the last piece is greater than or equal to the one right before it. If yes, you're done. If not, randomize the list and try again. Bogo squared sort has a time complexity of O of n times n factorial to the n. Power sort is one of my new favorites. Suppose you're given two numbers a and b with a less than b. Now, which is bigger, a to the b or b to the a? Well, if a and b are both bigger than the number e, then it will always be the smaller one to the bigger one, so a to the b. You can generalize this idea to more than two numbers. If they're all greater than e, then the greatest possible power tower will have them in literally ascending order. This can be turned into a sorting algorithm as long as all values are greater than e. You just iterate through all n factorial permutations of the list, evaluate the power tower for all of them, and whichever one is greatest, that will be the sorted list. All these joke sorting algorithms inspired me to come up with my own, which I'm going to call identity crisis sort. It starts with a modified quick sort, which does a partition, but instead of sorting each sublist recursively, it sorts them with a modified merge sort. This modified merge sort sorts the right half first, then the left half, both using the modified quick sort, and then combines them. This makes for an algorithm that looks ridiculous, but is still n log n. And those are all the algorithms I have for today. Even though I've covered a lot, there are still thousands upon thousands of sorting algorithms, so I can't actually explain all of them. But if you know one that I missed, feel free to explain it in the comments. If this video helped you finally understand some of these complicated algorithms, then make sure to like and subscribe. This past month has been by far the best month for my channel ever, so I really do mean it when I say thank you so much for watching and for your continued support. Having said that, I hope to see you again in the next video.
Bye.